is really vital. And I'll tell you why it's really vital. Your data, not your name, not any identifiers, but your data goes into a pool that goes to the feds that keeps us funded. And we are up for our grant renewal this year. Um, we're waiting for notification that we have to write our proposal, and we need those numbers. So I'm asking you if you would please do this. Um, that's one of the things that helps keep our education program alive. So I, I appreciate that. And um, so those of you who were not here yesterday, the bathrooms are outside the auditorium, behind the auditorium. So you know where those are. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to, um, before he actually I turn it over, I want to thank one more time our organizing committee. We always have a terrific committee. And uh, our hard workers, which are Mark Johnson on camera, Joe Zapata, who has obviously worked hard to coordinate all of this, uh, Dr. Tracy Cawthorn, whose conference this is, a former fellow of ours, um, now director of inpatient psychiatry at Northeast Baptist Hospital. So I'm sure from time to time you'll see her come and go. Uh, Barbara Giles, uh, who I just introduced already, and um, Tressa Edwards and Veronica Salazar from the VA, Greg, who also welcome you, and Marie Brendel who is volunteering from the Alzheimer's Association with us today. Yep. And we appreciate everybody's hard work on this program. It's been an excellent day yesterday. It'll be a great morning today. And with that, uh, Joseph Pod is going to take over. Please remain in your seats. <laughs> now, but first of all, I would like to thank Ms. Robles. Please raise your hand. She provided the donuts this morning. Thank you so much for that. You know, that glucose hit in the morning. Okay, I'm here to talk about CEUs. Uh, let's see, show of hands, how many are you are VA, VA employees? Awesome, okay, and non-VA? Okay, very good. Okay, VA employees, close your ears, shut your ears off, don't listen to what I'm about to say. Okay, if you are non-VA and you are seeking physician CEUs, nursing CEUs, or psychology CEUs, you will have to fill out a non-VA registration form, which is located in the back. So you can pick that up anytime today if you're seeking those type of CEUs. If you're seeking anything else besides that, you will have to fill out a participant profile, I mean, that's the uh, statement of attendance form, which is located in the pamphlet, and you can turn this in today to me at the end of the conference for anything else. Okay. Now, for those who will work at the VA, open your ears back up. Those who work non-VA, shut your ears off. Ears closed. Okay. If you work at the VA and you're seeking physician CEUs, nursing CEUs, or psychology CEUs, you need to go through TNS. You know all about TNS, hopefully. And if you have any more questions about TNS, I'll be happy to answer that. If you're seeking, for the VA employees only, if you're seeking social work CEUs or any other CEUs, you need to fill out a statement of attendance form. You need to fill this out completely and turn it in at the end of the conference today, which ends around noon, so we have to conference today. So if you have any other questions, I will be more than happy to answer any of uh, And if I can't answer them, I'll at least point you in the right direction. So just to make sure we're clear, does anybody have any questions right now uh, pertaining to CEUs? Any questions? What was that last form you showed? I'm sorry. I uh, this is the non. This one. Yeah. Uh, was that the last one? Right. Social worker. Social oh, worker. Okay. Okay. If you're a social worker, it's located in this form. Statement of attendance form is located on page three. <coughs> you just mark down at the very bottom uh, which CEU you, you want, social work, and then you're gonna write down how many credits you obtained. If, if you attended yesterday, then uh, just add them all up. Then you're going to print your name, and then you're going to email, I mean, print your email address right here. In a couple of days, I'm going to email you a link uh, for your evaluation, and uh, probably one or two days after you complete your evaluation, I'll send you a certificate online for your printing plus you. Thank you. So, uh, any other questions? Any to see you? Uh, 
Um, if you have any, uh, hey, I'm here to answer, that's all I'm here to do, to answer your questions. I'll be in back, in front of all the places, pull me aside, and I'll be happy to uh, help you out. Okay, uh, without further ado, our first speaker is Valerie Taylor. Uh, she was in the back row answering a lot of questions, asking a lot of questions, that is, and helping us out uh, with the speakers. And uh, she's a great human being, she's an awesome person, and uh, please help me welcome Valerie Taylor. Good morning, San Antonio! Yes. Go Spurs! I hope you wore your Spurs paraphernalia this morning. Um, I am just so happy to be on the program. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me back there? Okay, because I probably don't need much of a microphone. But um, I was asked to talk about the resources of the Alzheimer's Association, but it's so difficult to just limit it to just that. So we're going to kind of go through a process, and so I hope you'll bear with me. And, um, you know, I really am more of an interactive speaker, so please, if you, at any point you have any questions that I can't answer, there are people in the audience that can, so, um, you know, we will do that. But um, um, we're going to talk about um, the um, resources of the association. First of all, I'd like to um, introduce who I am. I am, I've done a whole lot of things, and anybody that's been in uh, working with geriatrics for a while probably know me. Um, I've got a private business called South Texas Alternative Choice that where we do placements, I do consultation, I do education, I do all of that stuff. But you know, the, the VA made me an offer that I could not refuse, and they allowed me to come and work in geriatrics here, where um, I work with the GREC, which and most people will say, well, what is GREC? GREC is our Geriatric Research edu <coughs> Education Clinical Center, and clinical center. And we do, our, some of our geriatricians work over in the bar shop. Um, they have a research um, labs here in the VA. Um, we work with the university. Uh, some of our doctors do work part-time over there. I mean, we have fellows going through. We've got residents coming through. We, the VA is actually a, it's part of that teaching hospital. So there is a lot of things going on, but I have been very fortunate to connect with this, I'm called the Greg Connect Nurse Manager. And I connect our seniors out in the rural areas, say like um, uh, Seguin, New Braunfels, that doesn't seem very rural, but it is. We've got rules, um, our clinical um, base, or our clinical, what is it, CBOC? Clinical community based yeah I'm, I'm new to the to uh, the VA so I'm still getting used to some of our um, acronyms but we go far as far out as Beeville Victoria um, Del Rio connecting our uh, geriatricians to those PCPs out there and there's a they, a lot of them do not know about geriatricians so I we do an e-consult where we are um, are a uh, provider we help them with their geriatric base. So it, it's really been good, you know, helping set up those programs and setting up those educational things. I also have a, um, um, I, I've been tasked to provide education for caregivers as well. So you'll see a lot of what I'm presenting today, some of what I'm presenting today, um, is dealing with caregivers. So um, let's move on and, uh, Okay, our learning objectives, name three reasons why it's important for you to know your resources. Resources in the position that you all are in is extremely important. You know, you may be the difference between life and death, not only for your patients, but for your caregivers, those that are caring for them. Identify as a health provider your role as a resource to your patient. Define caregiving burden and support. Identify local and national resources for caregivers. Okay, so those are our, our um, um, objectives. You've come a long way. We've come a long way. We have, from Dr. Alzheimer's, and um, who first was able to document what he has seen with Alzheimer's. 
that was phenomenal because once they began to continue to see those types of um, behaviors, they've done further auto autopsies, they realized what Dr. Alzheimer's <laughs> documented was, was very, um, very right on. And this lady over here on the side, um, that was his first patient. He did an autopsy of her and found, and I, I, I hate it that I did not bring um, the difference between an aging brain and a brain that was um, um, uh, eaten away with Alzheimer's, or an Alzheimer's brain, because it was just uh, amazing. But she was like 30, she was in her early 40s when she finally died. Um, but. And we're seeing some of that even now. You know, a lot of times, Alzheimer's, it depends on age. That's one of the biggest factors, um, either age with Alzheimer's or other dementias. Um, but at any rate, we've come a long way. One thing that we've got to keep in mind is coming. The silver tsunami is coming. And there is nothing that you can do that's going to stop it. Because we've got the baby boomers. And there, you, know, you, you, you don't have any choices as far as, well, we're, we're not going to get older. You know, I mean, if we could do that, turn back the hands of time, great, but that's not going to happen. So we have to prepare ourselves. I wish you could see these pictures a lot clearer, um, but this one down here is us being overwhelmed or overtaken by the tsunami. It's, it's overtaking our cities. It will overtake our nation. And so we've been having these uh, community discussions to talk about what is San Antonio going to do about the Alzheimer's um, issue? How are we going to begin handling um, as people get older? What type of modifications can we do with our city? What kind of things can we help with help our police force, our um, fire departments? How can we help people become more and more aware? Because right now, it is, we're like an ostrich with our head in the sand. Some of us know a little bit about Alzheimer's, but most of us don't. And you're, you're, a lot of times, when especially caregivers come to their doctors or they come to someone, they have absolutely no idea of what to do with that, that person that's, that's suffering from um, Alzheimer's disease. So we have to get a, a better handle on how we're going to uh, work with our, our community, work with uh, the people that are, are uh, suffering from Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Are you prepared? The reality is that, um, the reality is that many, ex uh, I can't even read that very well, let me come over here. The reality is that many um, enterprises that experience a disaster never recover. And so are we going to be in that position that we're going to be inundated with this tidal wave of Alzheimer's and not recover? Because you know what? Think about it. Everyone in this room has a destiny, has a destiny with age. And the things that we decide that we're going to do right now in dealing with our elderly population is going to affect you. It's going to affect you. So, um, are we going to recover or we're we not going to recover? Uh, there's an increase in Alzheimer's disease. Currently, there are 5.3 million. Some of this, you know, we've gotten some of this information already, but just to kind of reiterate, um, with Alzheimer's, it's anticipated to rise to 13.8 uh, to 16 million by 2050. That's a whole lot of demented people. <laughs> that, really, it's a whole lot. So, but this is what we look like now. You know, we're looking pretty good. We're doing everything we can to stay young. Our families are still loving on us and everything. But there's going to come a part of a time where it's going to be extremely difficult. A picture says a thousand words. What do you think of this picture saying? <coughs> Excuse me? They're having a consult? Why do you think they're having a consult? What news do you think they're getting? Look at his head. <laughs> Either um, mild cognitive impairment or something is going on. And it's not good when you're sitting in, in front of the doctor and the doctor is somewhat trying to convince you of something is going on. More than likely. The disease progresses. progresses. What do you think is going on here? 
Shouldn't, probably should not be driving. You know, I don't, I, I personally, I don't like the term wandering because it, it you know, when I, I envision wandering as something aimlessly, you know, people are just kind of trying to figure out. That comes, but usually when people get lost, they have an idea of where they were going and they forget. Or it's a place that is in one of their uh, past memories about going someplace and they can't find it. So I, 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 I'm, I'm reluctant. I, I, it's a bittersweet because in some cases, yeah, it is wandering, but you know, there it's not like they're doing it aimlessly. You know, that's what I think about when I think about wandering. Um, then you come to a point where, what am I going to do with mom or dad? Very stressful. And a lot of times, your caregivers are the only ones. They don't have a whole lot of help. Advanced directives. You know, you want to make sure that when people are initially diagnosed or they're still pretty early in their diagnosis, they get certain legal things in place. Because if not, as Kelly had uh, indicated yesterday, they, if they don't have capacity, you can forget it. You're gonna, you're gonna spend time in court, and it's gonna be an ex expensive um, uh, tour. Unable to stay at home alone. Sometimes that not being able to stay home alone is a good thing because you can take them, they can go to a day program, um, you know, you can have in, them involved in some type of activity, and a lot of times they still may be able to um, participate, you know, they're, they're social enough to be able to do that. Things quickly progress. And this is often a real problem with the medications. You know, things happen, apraxia, difficulty walking and writing, the polypharmacy, the aggression, depression, weight loss, frailty, wandering. Caregiver burden and stress. Caregiver burnout. They need help. And if they do not get supported, they're going to end up dying or definitely disabled. And they cannot um, help that person any longer. And it's going to cause a tremendous burden on our system whether you're civilian or military or veteran, all three. What is the difference between caregiver stress and caregiver burden? And um, Kathy Jo Kress, a social worker, says that caregiver stress is the level of stress or strain felt by the caregiver. This strain is often caused by things the caregiver has no control of. For example, caring for a loved one 24-7, what if something happens to me? Who will care for my loved one? You know, those are things they can't control for. Or they don't feel that they can control for. Caregiver burden. Oh, oh excuse me. Okay, caregiver <laughs> burden. Refers to the management of tasks, organization, which depends partly on the coping skills and other supports that are available. This is the energy needed to provide for caregiving needs of a senior relative compared to the individual's own reserves. And this, you know, when it becomes really burdensome and stressful, it is the perfect storm for disaster. You know, because some of the things we talked about, elder abuse, um, we talked about, um, um, you know, the fraud, the abuse, the, all of those things, those things are what begins to come up. Not so much with the, uh, the fraud and, and um, you know, taking people's resources and stuff, but, you know, especially the abuse. Because when they've asked you for the 50th millionth time the same question, and you can no longer take it, and you're so inundated with the care and the, now they're, they're, they're in diapers, and you're having to change all of those things. Perfect setup for abuse. Perfect. 
The impact of, of stress and burden, it can be a, uh, a huge stress and burden for the caregiver. They end up doing the ADLs, the IADLs, doctor's appointments, paying bills, driving, meals, everything. And if they are a woman and, or, and the husband or a companion, if they're still living, there may be even a demand for sex. Can you imagine? I mean, I've got a, a relative that is currently um, involved in all of that. And I put that on there because we got to keep it real. After taking care of someone all day, and then at the end of the day, you're saying, can't we have sex? <laughs> Not going to happen. They're too tired. And you know, you, you, you develop a different type of relationship. Okay. Phew. What is needed? Caring for the caregiver. Caregivers need care too. You see the lady over here in the corner, just I mean, over, clearly overwhelmed. The caregiver burnout, how to avoid caregiver burnout. You know, these are the things that they need. And it's extremely important that we as health professionals are able to provide those type of services and those type of resources for our um, people that we're serving. Because we are, it's a service. And you know what, whether you're a social worker and nurses specifically, are very much nurturers and caregivers. You know what, a lot of times, and, and, and people might, might disagree, but my doctor can't do her job effectively without me. And I'm not trying to raise myself on a pedestal, but what happens is there are things that we see that they don't see because they're usually, their focus is on the, the medical, their focus is on the disease process, you know, some of them are, are real different, and especially, I think one of the most sensitive, there are two doctors that are really very sensitive by nature, pediatricians and geriatricians. Yeah. Very, very, very sensitive. So, um, but we gotta be sensitive to this plight. And if, if our doctors don't, aren't aware of it, we can tell them, you know what, they were looking pretty disheveled today. I'm talking about the caregiver or they look really stressed, we're able to pick up on those things. And it doesn't matter if you're male or female. If you're a nurturer, you're going to pick up on that. How can you help recognize the stress dynamics? Be sensitive. Refer to someone who can help relieve this overwhelming stress and burden. Train your staff to recognize the warning signs of caregiver stress. Take a minute out of your schedule. Visit to ask how the caregiver is doing. Just take a minute. It's easy. Most of the time when they go, especially to the PCP, they have this interaction with the computer. You know, they might look up at the person if they're on a subject that uh, they're, they're typing about, but for the most part, you know, that, that, that relationship a lot of times does not get established. So it's up to the nursing staff before they come in to, the, uh, to see the patient to tell the doctor what's going on. Now I'm not saying that all doctors are like that. Don't get me wrong, because they're not. But for the most part, you have to let them know, bring their attention, draw their attention to different things. You've got to. Encourage the caregiver to keep a journal to be better prepared to share how you can help. If things are going on, tell the caregiver, document that. You know, so that when you come into the doctor's office, you can share what is, what's going on. Because without that information, that's vital information that you can provide for the doctor, and that will make a difference in how they address that person and, and what the type of, um, what, what, where they go with it. So, but if, if the caregiver who lives with them 24-7 is not providing with them with the information that they need, how is the doctor going to know? They're not. So we have to encourage them to document. Become familiar with your local, state, and national resources. That is our responsibility. We have to be able to give the, um, the patient or uh, the caregiver information, needed information, because you can't help them, and you're not there. But maybe someone else can help them, and they can be there. Available resources. Now we're on resources. And you know, this is um, it's really not going to, this part of it, it's not going to take an hour. 
But, you know, I wanted to leave time for you to be able to ask some questions. And I do have some resources in the back, so I'll tell you about that. Um, but the Alzheimer's Association, and I am a member of the, the board on the, for the Alzheimer's Association. We've got the South Texas and Star um, chapter. Um, they indicated that Marie back there is uh, one of the volunteers for the Alzheimer's Association. And so she is a wealth of information as well. Um, but uh, San Antonio and South Texas chapter uh, serves 47 country, counties in South, Central and South Texas, and they provide a variety of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, and they support, and they have support programs and services. For about five years, I taught at the, um, for NISD, I guess the Northside Independent School District, um, I taught a lot of the dementia courses um, for family, and this, these are free classes that people can go and get more information, the 10 warning signs, the basics of Alzheimer's disease, um, legal, um, you know, so there's a lot of information that is provided. And these are experts in their particular areas, activities, communication, how those behaviors that people are, are going through, they are able to help them to have a better understanding. Because you know what? When you, when, you, when you know better, you'll do better. <clears throat> And people don't know what they don't know. And a lot of times we have a tendency to expect people to know something that we know. Well, why didn't they know that? They don't know what they don't know. You know, so sometimes it's important to, to refrain from being judgmental and provide them with the information. And if you have to keep telling them the same information over and over again, I question you know, whether they are really able, is it, is there, do they have something cognitively going on? And a lot of times the caregivers have something going on too. So we have to be real aware and cognizant of that. Um, so anyway, moving on. Um, still with Alzheimer's services. They have a 24-7 hotline, and this is their number, 1-800-272-3900, and it's staffed by highly trained professionals who can assist with a variety of issues. Um, and one thing about the, um, the Alzheimer's Association, it's in, they, they're based in Chicago. This number will go take you to Chicago. They have trained social workers that have been, they can, t they can talk to you. If, they, if a person needs assistance at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, someone is there. They can call. I'm having a problem. They've got this um, either sundowning or they're up in the middle of the night. They're urinating all over the place. And, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with all of that. And so they will give you some really good suggestions and um, tell you how to deal with that behavior because that behavior didn't just start at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. That behavior started at, say, 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. You know, and what was going on through the day. And they can help you explore some of those things. So they can also uh, talk to you about treatments, clinical trials, um, care strategies, legal, financial, and housing decisions. And I just want to give a plug for our clinical trials. We've got clinical trials going on right now here in San Antonio. The Bar Shop Institute, which is, how many of you know where Tranco Road is? Okay. All the way out the Tranco Road is the Bar Shop Institute. And that is our, um, that's the GREC. Um, we've got uh, doctors out there doing research. Um, and they have some clinical trials going on out there. Even the doctor that I work for, Dr. Espinoza, has clinical trials going on. Dr. Royal, here's Dr. Royal. He is one of our renowned researchers. Um, and so he and I have also, we work together on some of the, um, the data that I um, um, am collecting. Um, but they, we've got folks that are going on right here in San Antonio. We have things going on. Uh, rapamycin, have you heard of that drug with Alzheimer's disease? Okay, rapamycin out at the bar shop, they were testing some of the, uh, the mice out there and they found out that this medication that's used for other things um, like um, uh, organ rejections, and, and, and um, it, it, it also has a place with helping cancer um, or decreasing the um, proliferation of cancer. Um, it also has an effect on Alzheimer's disease. 
And so they found that if it's if it's given in, 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 a, in a timely manner, it will not be expressed. You know, those that have been um, uh, given the gene for it, it will not, it won't be expressed. So there's there's more that goes on with that than I, I'm able to even express. But we've got things. That's the point. We've got things that are going on right here in San Antonio. Um, all's connected. Um, there are, it, it will connect you with Alzheimer's navigation, trial match, resource and referral list, caregiver center. And so all of these things, that's, that's right online. If you go to www.allsconnected.org, it'll provide you information there. Um, safety services, it, oh my gosh. I, you know what? Add W, that yellow WWW stuff. I mean, you cannot see it. Um, I know, it's horrible. Um, <clears throat> uh, Medic Alert, which is a, um, an Alzheimer's safe return. Um, www.medicalert.com uh, backslash safe return. I don't know why they do that. I mean, that wasn't me putting it in those, uh, that color. Um, there's a driving resource, Dementia and Driving Resource Center, and that's www.alts.org backslash driving. I don't think it's backslash. Well, forward slash? I think so. Okay. Well, it's slash. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then there's Comfort Zone, www.alts.org slash Comfort Zone. Okay. So those are the safety. And so sometimes, you know, you, all you have to do is just give people the resources that they need. That helps. But to shut the door and say, well, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. If we can give them something that they, that's tangible, that they can hold on to, um, the Alzheimer's Association is a great resource. And again, like I said, the educational programs um, that are offered on a regular basis throughout the community and by request. We started out doing the Northside Independent School District. Now we have expanded that to the Northeast. And I'm hoping that we'll go also to San Antonio uh, uh, Independent School District as well. Um, and in those areas, there is no charge for these courses, like the knowing the 10 uh, signs, the basics, memory loss, dementia, and Alzheimer's, living with Alzheimer's series, the financial legal mat uh, matters, but it's also available online. And there's an uh, online resource list as a brochure, uh, e-learn, h-t-t-p, semicolon, back, slash, slash, e-learn, dot alts dot org okay support groups there are support groups all over town and sometimes people must talk about they just need some place to go and vent um, and I'll tell you what we're doing here at the VA in a few minutes but um, the support sessions are a valuable therapeutic um, uh, intervention for assisting persons with Alzheimer's disease and their families we, the Alzheimer's uh, uh, organization has an early um, uh, diagnosed group for those folks with Alzheimer's disease so that they can begin talking about what's going on with them, you know, how they're feeling. It's a grieving process. You know, they start grieving from the moment they're diagnosed because most people, you don't have to tell them that they've got something going on with them. They know. You know, when we forget, we call it senior moments, but you know, when we have things going on, the first thing that comes in our mind is, oh, I'm hoping that it's not all centers. And don't have a parent that has some type of dementia, mm -hmm. you know, because then all kinds of red flags, and then we start getting into our denial, no, I don't have it, or anything like that. But um, it's just very important that, um, we begin to um, discuss that. And sometimes it may not come up on some of the testing. You know, sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't reveal itself. But you know what? We know. We know. Um, but the groups are uh, help people overcome their feelings of isolation, depression, despair. They're, they are confidential. 
um, coordinated by trained facilitators. Um, Russell Gaynor um, is one of the, I took over his group over at the forum, um, but there are other trained social workers and nurses that run these, and some of the uh, facilitators may not necessarily even be social workers or nurses, but they have been working the business for a long time. They um, have been with the Alzheimer's, and so they understand. I think Marie does a group also um, over at United, is it United Methodist Church? University of United Methodist. And so she works, she's a co-facilitator with someone else. But if you're interested in, in, in referring your folks to any of these groups, and they can be very helpful, call the Alzheimer's Association. Okay. Um, community outreach activities. There, the, our vision in the Alzheimer's Association is a world without Alzheimer's. To achieve this vision, we must raise public awareness and create a more accurate understanding of the disease its symptoms and early warning. And that's one of the things that has been said throughout this conference. Early detection is so very important. You know, when you have, most families will say, oh, well, that's just how Aunt Edna is, you know. She may be a little quirky, but she may have some, some dementia, some type of dementia. And you don't have to know if it's Alzheimer's, is it vascular, is it Lewy body. You don't have to know that. You just need to know that she's got something going on. And we need to get her into the doctor and so that we can, uh, you know, we can um, have some medical um, direction on how we're dealing with her. And there are many reasons. It's not sometimes those uh, reasons that people may be behaving um, kind of quirky or that might be their personality, but if it's a sudden onset, it might be polypharmacy, it may be an infection, it could be something going on physiologically or with, um, you know, B vitamins or thiamine or thyroid, dehydration, thank you. You know, so there, there are other things that could definitely cause uh, disorientation and the confusion. So, but we can't diagnose that. You need to take them into a specialist so that they can begin to, um, you know, look at what's going on, okay? And that's, and I'll put my plug in right now for a geriatrician. Geriatricians are a manager of, of people in their, 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 especially the elderly with their um, uh, different comorbidities, the different things that are going on with them. A geriatrician, they're, 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 they're the bomb. They really are. Um, usually the um, other disciplines like uh, internists, um, psychiatrists, psychologists, they definitely have a place. But you know who manages all of those, those uh, areas is the geriatrician. And so you need those other disciplines because that's part of that interdisciplinary team, your dietitian, your PharmD, all of those. But the geriatrician is who manages all of those um, different services and that patient. Um, community outreach, the, the Alzheimer's Association um, does do all outreach. A promotion of our website, and I'll come up over here, www.alts.org and uh, www.alts.org San Antonio, slash San Antonio. Walk to End Alzheimer's is, is our biggest fundraiser. And we not only have it here in San Antonio, but we have it in, uh, there's like, we've got seven walks now. Is that right, Marie? Yes. We've got seven walks, and the newest was um, down in Victoria, is that right? Yes. Okay, we have Victoria, McAllister, um, I can't, I'm not going to try to name all of them, but we do have New Braunfels in here. I know four, four out of the seven. So, um, you know, and that is really huge. This year, we even had a, um, a walk team from, um, um, uh, from Audie Murphy. And Veronica, uh, Dr. Shedd was part of that um, walk team that we established here at, um, at Audie Murphy. And, you know, this was our first year. We did pretty good. This was our first year. And so she and Dr. Moss from uh, the CLC, our Community Living Center, were participants in that. So, you know, I, I would encourage you um, in each of your areas, please form a walk team. Think about that for next year. So. 
um, advocacy. We encourage you to join our efforts to raise concern and awareness among our le elected officials. And there is a campaign to do more on legally for folks that, would, that, that experience Alzheimer's. So important because those laws, the things that, that are happening today are going to affect us tomorrow. So, www.alts.org slash advocacy. Okay, veterans resources. Now, most of you in the room are not with the VA, but your people that you see may be eligible for the VA. And so what you want to do is make sure you've got all the resources that you can, you know, to help that, that person. Um, in addition to the Alzheimer's Association, the VA resources are right here. Rural Brett Connect, um, connecting rural, and I told you about that, but that's with Dr. Espinosa, that's my, my doctor, um, and her extension is 15806, especially if you, if you, your client sometimes might be um, in one of the other VAs outside of Otto Murphy, you know, maybe one of the clinics, out in the community, you know, they can uh, send us an e-consult and we can address that with their CPC. The Greck Gym Clinic, um, the ECTC, e um, the CLC, Dr. Rivodi, Dr. Kellogg, and that's um, one thing that we have to make sure if you are always asked, and I'm sure you do, if a person is a veteran, and once you do that, ask them, are they enrolled in the VA? Okay, that is so important because a lot of services they may not be able to access if they're not members here of the VA. And so we want to make sure they're connected. Okay? Um, we've got also a hospice and palliative care with Pat Haney. How many of you know the difference between hospice and palliative care? Kind of. You know what? I just found out. You know, I mean, I didn't know the difference. The difference between, and I think um, Dr. Shedd uh, mentioned it yesterday, you know, with hospice, you have to have, they've got to determine whether it's six months, you got six months out to live. You know, you might live seven or eight months, and, and that's okay. But, you know, you've got a, a very narrow time frame, okay? Whereas with palliative care, you can have three years, you can continue with your therapies. Say you've been diagnosed with cancer and you want to go through chemo or radiation therapy, any of those, you can do that. You can still continue to do that. You know, and then, because you're already in the system, if those don't work, and you know your time is limited, you can transition over to hospice. I mean, but they are such a help. You've got nurses that come out, you've got techs that come out, you've got um, doctors that, well, maybe not the doctors, but you've got um, chaplains that'll come out. You know, you still have a support with your palliative care. Did I miss something, Dr. Shen? And we do have, we have both of those right here. This is our service. So, you know, I think it's important that you are familiar with what the VA does offer their veterans. So we, like uh, Dr. Shev, I don't know if you heard that, we've got inpatient uh, hospice care and we have outpatient. And palliative care is always outpatient care, okay? But we also, one of the things that she was saying, and I, and I think I have it on here, but respite. Now, on the outside, you'll see, I'll show you. Um, usually, they may have offer seven days, like with ACOG. They have seven days of respite. But you know what? The VA offers 30 days a year. And you can take that however you want to take it. So if you weren't familiar with that, you know, that's a service. So you could total, you can have maybe a total of 37 respite days. Okay? Uh, Home-based primary care. 
Uh, and I, I bubble back, uh, hospice palliative care, Pat Haney is the contact. And that's her number, uh, extension 16709. Now, the, to get into the system, it's 617-5300. And then they'll ask you for an extension. Okay? 617-5300. Okay? So they have home-based primary care. <coughs> when your, your patients that you work with aren't able to go out to their doctor's appointments, the doctors can come to them, okay? And uh, Brenda Quarles at 210-617-5300. And I did not, you know what, if they, uh, just ask for the operator and just tell them what you want, okay? Um, home community-based care um, uh, with Nancy Verdeen. Now, what that does is, um, I'm not sure, I thought I knew. But I'm not sure with the whole community-based care. They do the home health aid, home aid program. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's the home aid. So they send folks into the home, correct? Yes. Yeah, they send folks into the, the home, agencies. the agencies. Okay. Another resource. Now, what is the charge to that? Um, typically, there's not a charge. Sometimes there's a copay of maybe $15. Okay. But usually not the charge. Okay. Very good. Could you say what she said there? She said that the home, I asked if there was a charge, and it's not usually a charge. There may be a copay. There may be a $15 copay. Now, is that a $15 per hour copay? Or? No, I believe it's per visit, and I'm not sure if it's if, how it is. With Limited the, limitation? Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm not super familiar with it, but usually okay. for the long term care services, it's $15 per visit. Okay. So and it's very rare. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Can I give you a direct number to home based primary? Yes. It's six one six eight two four zero. Eight. Six one six eight two four zero. Eight two four zero. Okay. I is that community or primary? Okay, she's gonna repeat it again with the microphone. Six six one six. Eight two four zero. That comes directly to um, the office, which is located at one text. Community based or home based? Home based. Home based primary mm -hmm. care. I mean, if you call the office. Okay, home based, not community based. No, just the home base. Um, if you, well, actually, they're over there as well. But if you do call the operator 617-5300 and name any of those, they're going to transfer you to us. I just gave you the direct number. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, medical foster home, um, Janice Penner, um, and this is her number. And that has to do with if you've got a veteran and they need some place to stay, she has resources for them to uh, to go to within their pension. Okay, and uh, usually they're small, they're smaller homes, they're residential care homes. They're not, uh, you know, I, I don't like to call them boarding homes at all. They're residential care, VA residential care homes, and uh, but those are geared towards the veteran. And sometimes, you know, our vets, they, they love to be around other vets because they have something in common. Uh, yeah. Are they long-term? Are they long-term? Yes. Yeah, they, they are long-term in terms of um, as long as they're ambulatory, you know, if they are bed-bound or something like that, Janice will have to uh, make a different type of recommendation. And usually what she, you know, that might be a nursing home type situation or something different, okay? But if they're like kind of like homeless, but they have, you know, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month that, that they have coming in, you know, there is a certain, they can, they can place them. Okay. So, but that is, that's VA. I mean, you know, at that service. Right. Telehealth. Um, is another service that um, they, there's a nurse that may, um, that's local, they will um, have a, a, a camera, we call it our jabber system, with the home, and it's easy here in San Antonio because our cable system, our, our network is, is a lot better than rural. I'm still working on that rurally, 
but um, but you have a nurse that may call the family and be able to see have a face to face type of visit um, that can also happen with the doctors too. Um, we have that going on in our rural community. They uh, might the folks that may have suffer from PTSD or some of the other um, uh, dealing with psychiatry. They will have a, they can have a face to face. Uh, from with people from here in San Antonio and see them in uh, the doctors here in San Antonio and see a, a patient um, say in uh, Victoria, you know, because they've got that that uh, telehealth um, system um, set up down there. So people from Beeville will go over to um, Victoria and uh, see the, the the doctor on face to face. They also have uh, contract nursing homes. You know, we've got, um, if you've got a veteran um, that needs um, uh, long-term care, as you were asking, um, they need a nursing home type situation, if they're a vet, then we need to be contacted. Debbie L uh, Loya is the contact for that, and that is her direct number. <coughs> Adult daycare, um, for example, I say I use Primrose as a, 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 a good example, although there are other daycares also, Grace Place, and there may be some others, um, um, but uh, Kimberly Jones is over that, and they can give them a voucher. They'll pay for that. You know, so that is a resource the family does not have to pay for if they're a veteran. Respite services, and like I said, up to 30 days, Kimberly Jones is also um, on that. That's her contact number. You've got Kirby. Oh, I'm so sorry. Kerrville um, has VA services out there as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, transportation services, that can be found at Frank Tejeda. Um, caregiver support, um, Alicia, Hart, Alicia uh, Hartfield Cordero. She's a social worker here, and um, she's got a vast of information um, about different caregiver services. Um, and I teach, um, I'm with the GREC, and that's my extension, 15668. Um, I've got a caregiver support uh, class that I do once a month, and that's down in the gym clinic. Um, and it's a didactic, and I um, brought a couple of um, uh, some information. We're caring for, uh, caring for the person with dementia. Um, I'm on a series right now. Last week we talked about the disease of dementia and Alzheimer's specifically. Um, this next class is the behaviors and communication. And then on the, uh, in December we're going to talk about understanding dementia, uh, the late stage, legal, palliative care, hospice, and the actual care of, uh, for the, uh, uh, the person with dementia. Um, then you've got your aid and attendant. Most people are kind of familiar um, with that, that service now. Art Sweezy is uh, the person that is that can give you information. Um, there is um, uh, uh, the forms for that and everything. That Art Sweezy, Sweezy, very very important because if there if a veteran's income is not a certain at a certain rate. He can certainly help you with that. Okay, now there's a criteria, and that's not to say that everybody that's a veteran are, that will qualify for that. I'm not saying that at all, but he can help you, you know, at least direct the family to them, and they, he can, can um, direct you for that. Yes, ma'am. Can you give us the uh, number for Alicia? Uh -huh. I sure can. Um, Alicia's number is 2106. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 617. That's why I asked. I, you know what, my secretary. We'll call she, you. <laughs> you know, yeah, call me. <laughs> Maybe they can use the last one. <laughs> well, yeah, use the last one. Use my number. Um, okay. But you know what, I, I'm firing my secretary. So. Do you have a name or anyone for the to link to the transportation? Uh, at Frank Tejeda? You know what? I don't. Does anybody know who's in, uh, the contact for transportation at, at Frank Tejeda? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to say I'm not familiar. 
transportation, we usually call the main hospital. I'm, I'm not sure okay. what transportation that transportation is. But the direct number um, is 617-5300 and then 5999. That's okay. transportation for okay. the, the VA. Okay. That's the main transportation number. Well, there's a, you know, in, in that, that is true, and that might get you where you're going, but I know that over at Frank Tejeda, there is a specific area that they have to apply to, um, and, and so, you know, what I would do is 617-5300 and just tell them what you need. I need to enroll uh, my loved one or what have you into, for transportation, and they may be able to direct you. And um, this young lady over here indicated a 617-5300-5999. That's the main. That's the main. That's the main transportation. So you know, I don't know, and I apologize for that. Okay. How much time do I have? About five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. So you know, either one of those. But if you call the main number and ask for transportation, they should probably be able to help you. Okay. Beer. Uh, local um, ACOG services, the Bear Senior uh, Bear Area Agency on Aging, and this is our um, uh, agency on aging uh, within. That's our federal. It's a federal program. It is also funded by Dad's the Development Dad's Department of Aging and Disabilities. Um, and it's a the Alamo Service Connection that we're talking about that yesterday. Um, they will certainly help you. Um, their care navigators and help you with different services. Um, they will help you with, there's education for caregivers. How do you, um, uh, the service that I have been in part involved with deals with um, educating caregivers on how to, uh, how to do different types of care needs that your loved one has. And it doesn't necessarily have to just relate to Alzheimer's. It's, if you have to change a catheter, if you have to turn a person in bed, make up a bed, um, it, it talks about um, um, giving um, insulin, it talks about um, your vitals, you know, and the importance of all of these different um, things. No charge. And there are two nurses that um, that are involved in that, and I'm, I've been one of the nurses too. Um, but this is open to anyone, people with disabilities, veterans, or families. Um, they also, this is another service that can connect you with, uh, via trans, with the transportation, respite, education, and much more. Um, also, you know, I, I just kind of included this, 211 Adult Protective Services and DADS. Okay, those are all informational services that, that you'll be able to get. Finally, mmlearn.org. How many of you heard of mmlearn? Okay, good resource for families because they don't have to go anywhere. They can be right at home if they're able, if they're computer literate at all. You know, they can put that in and then they have a list of different educational uh, programs that they can tap into right in the, the privacy of their own home. Um, senior resource guide, I've got some guides, I've got information back in the back that um, might be helpful. Some of you, I know you are aware of that, but the senior resource guide contains over 80 categories of information from senior centers and activities to senior housing and in-home care. Now, it also it provides you with um, VA information. It has some numbers in there, maybe the numbers that I did not give you, but it's got a lot of good information in there. Um, it, there's one of the books uh, with uh, the latest one is with Miss uh, Senior America. This is the latest one that just came out. And this one with Augie Myers on the cover of it on page, okay, three minutes. On, on page um, 87 is an article that I wrote. Um, and I'm usually in the spring, I usually write an article in there. Um, but does it have to be dementia? That's the, and, and no, it doesn't have to be dementia. When you have a lot of these signs, it could be something else. And so I identify that. Um, and then here's a number that you can go and get um, free copies. Um, like I said, the information is included there. Um, you are a part of a journey of hope and support. Don't forget you're on the journey with them. The next person with dementia might be you. So 
there's a, just a few many, okay, think about it. Age is a factor for de developing Alzheimer's dementia. We are setting the standard now for how our elderly population will be cared for professionally, personally, and by extended caregivers. The next time you look in the mirror, consider where you might be in the next 20 years. You, will you be alone or supported and treated with respect and kindness? Questions? We've got a minute for any questions. Six seconds. This is the best. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And also, too, just let you know, there's a box in the back that has the resource guides. There is a, a some pamphlets back there about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so please feel free to take any of that.